Okay, welcome everyone. So it's a pleasure for me to host today Felix Goñi. Um, as you know, uh, some time ago they started, I mean, they decided to implement this somehow out of the box talks, which might not be strictly cancer or cell cycle related, but that will be a diff you know, different touch. And for those of you that follow a little bit uh, the, the you know, Juan journal that you should read, which is the one from the Spanish Society of Biochemistry, Felix had an article there which actually I read and I enjoyed very much, which was about biochemistry in the kitchen. And I knew that he was giving talks here and there in Madrid that people enjoyed about this topic, so I thought it was a good match. Felix is a MD, but it's a rara avis MD. I mean, very early in his career, he got attracted by, by biophysics, I and by membrane biophysics, and he actually did a postdoc in London in membrane bio and lipid protein interactions, and then for the last 30 years has been working in the University of the Basque Country where I grew up, I didn't grow up much, but I, that's where I did my, my studies. <laughs> and um, he's been, a, he's now a full professor there, has been a full professor for the last 30 years. And he's one of these, uh, you know, list of names that you should know from those years where not that much molecular biology, bi biochemistry was going on in Spain. Uh, Philip was able to secure a new institute dedicated to biophysics in, in the Basque Country, where they have focus on, on membrane biophysics. He's been the chair of the publications from FEBS, very, you know, very heavily involved with the Spanish Society of Biochemistry and also biophysics, where he was the president. And he, I mean, the one thing that I do remember is that he was a very good teacher because he was my teacher every now and then. So I'm pretty sure you will enjoy the talk. So thanks for coming, Felix. Okay, thank you, Oscar, and thank you, everybody, for being here. <clears throat> uh, yes, now that you are here, well seated, I can tell you that this is not the title of my talk. <laughs> the title of my talk is this one. Biophysical properties of novel 1-deoxydihydrocinamides occurring in mammalian cells. So it's applied science, mammalian cells, you see. We have been working for the last couple of years or so on this marvelous deoxin um, ceramides. Why didn't I say that this was the real title of my talk? Obviously, because none of you would be here, <laughs> not even Oscar. <laughs> and I desperately need an audience. So, well, I made this little fib. Well, of course, this is a joke. This is, this is not the real title. The real title is, is uh, bio, Biochemist in the Kitchen. But it's interesting that when you work on what? Genomics. You give talks on genomics. And when you work on protein structure, you give talks on protein structures. But when you work on lipids, then you give talks on cuisine. <laughs> well, not bad. But <laughs> yes, yes, this is the, this is the talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <laughs> But uh, even if it, this is not the, the talk, I can't refrain from proclaiming that fat is beautiful. <laughs> Look at these fantastic molecules with their hydrophobic part and the hydrophilic part and all the things they can do. Not to mention, huh? The sterols, look at that, cyclo-eucalinol, obfusifolial, aren't they beautiful? Of course, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. But even old Popeye the sailor was interested in, in <laughs> olive oil.
Incidentally, one of the unsolved mysteries of the 20th century, did Popeye and Olive go to bed together? <laughs> nobody knows, and per perhaps nobody will ever know. Olive oil, in turn, had her own interest in lipids. Oops. Uh, now, yes? Fat is beautiful. <coughs> Perhaps nobody has put it better than my friend and colleague Uli Mauritsen in his book, Life as a Matter of Fat. OK, up to now, my commercial about lipids. And then I go to my talk. A biochemist in the kitchen. And I will be developing, uh, essentially, these uh, six uh, uh, parts of different length. Uh, I presume you can read, all of you, so I don't have to, to read these titles now. But uh, the first part is me and my kitchen. And this funny question, how do I cook? Why am I asking, how do I cook? Well, I don't ask it, but people ask me. You see, uh, when typically my wife and I are attending one of those parties with people that you know, but you don't know very much, uh, et cetera, and uh, nobody knows what to say, and, and so on, sometimes, somehow, it is disclosed that I do the cooking at home. And if the other person happens to know that I'm a biochemist, then I perceive immediately a special face they make. And they ask, and how do you cook? <laughs> what do you mean, how do you cook? I cook like anybody else. But they, I know very well what they are thinking, because this has happened many times. They are thinking, do you cook with chemistry? This awful word, chemistry, full of danger. Full of danger against our health. Chemistry will cause the disappearance of the human species. Huh? So after two or three exchanges, they really make the question. Do you cook as if you are in the lab? Do you use chemistry in your cooking? And my reply is, I do not use chemistry in my cooking. Cooking is chemistry, food is chemistry, and I am chemistry. And with these, they remain sufficiently baffled so that I can <laughs> leave them and go for the next tapa or glass of wine. But to you, especially to you, I will give the complete answer. I cook like anybody else, of course. But maybe I am thinking of different things while I am cooking. When most people are cooking, they are thinking of the last match of Real Madrid or of the bills they have to pay at the end of the month or whatever. When I'm frying an egg, I confess that I tend to think of thermal denaturation of proteins. <laughs> when I am mm, mm, cleaning the artichokes and I am putting some lemon juice to, to prevent them from browning, I'm thinking that I'm inhibiting polyphenol oxidase by lowering the pH. I can't avoid it. It's in my nature, like in the story of the scorpion. It's in my genes, probably. Uh, so how do I cook? I cook like anybody else, except I have a different interpretation, or a peculiar interpretation, perverted, maybe, interpretation, of what is going on in my 
uh, uh, pan. Uh, yes, when I do a pill pill sauce, look at this beautiful pill pill sauce, uh, the, the, the mm, mm, most traditional Bilbao dish, cod in pill pill sauce, bacalao al pill pill. Huh? The pill pill sauce, uh, 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 for the mm, degraded eyes of this lipid biophysicist, is just an emulsion of olive oil in water, stabilized by the proteins of the fish skin. That's the pill pill sauce. And I'm thinking of the bloody emulsion all the time when, when, I, when, I'm, doing, when I'm doing this dish. I, I, I can't avoid it. Only, incidentally, this is not cod. This is an onion. <laughs> I will show you a few pictures of, and this is totally anecdotal. Well, the, the whole talk is anecdotal after all. Uh, um, these, these are dishes from restaurant Nerua. Nerua is the restaurant of the Guggenheim Museum in, in Bilbao, a, a restaurant that, in my opinion, is much more interested, interesting than, than most of the exhibits in the, in the museum. Um, and here, yes, the, the, it's a real pil pil sauce. It's a real cut skin, and this is a real onion. But anyway, what I, I wanted to say is that, yes, this is an emulsion. It, it can be interpreted as an emulsion, and it can be uh, um, um, sometimes even improved using elementary principles of, of, of um, physical chemistry of colloids. This is another example of interpretation. Well, this is a foie gras, obviously, and it has been <laughs> Um, lightly toasted uh, in, with, with, with just a few a monomolecular film of, of olive oil, I would say. And uh, yes, the, 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 the cooks, the chefs, have words for, for doing this. But I can't avoid, again, thinking of the Maillard reaction, uh, the Maillard reaction uh, that mm, mm, gives the, the food this very appetizing brown color when, when it is cooked. Again, an obvious culinary uh, process interpreted in a strange way. So this is how I cook. I cook like anybody else. I am sorry to disappoint you. Uh, the second point, and this is probably the, the, the most important message in my talk, because believe it or not, this talk has a message. <laughs> Science is not against traditional cuisine. Very often, very often, science, particularly chemistry, is presented as the enemy of of cuisine. And it is just the opposite. It is absolutely the opposite. But we have, well, a real problem. The real problem is called vitalism. And vitalism never dies. Maybe, of course, there is something in vitalism that uh, mm, uh, uh, keeps it alive all the time. But you see, around in the 1820s, uh, Friedrich Wöhler synthesized urea from ammonium uh, isocyanate. Urea was considered to be a biomolecule. Uh, ammonium isocyanate was considered to be an inorganic salt. So he, uh, Wöhler is, cre is credited with having synthesized the first biological molecule from inorganic precursors. And this had a tremendous philosophical implications in his time, because everybody thought that biological molecules had something special in them, 
had some élan vital, in the words of the French philosopher Bergson, uh, some spirit, soul, whatever you like. But Werner goes there and synthesizes urea, not a fantastically complex organic molecule to our eyes, but they didn't know that. The only thing they knew <coughs> is that it was a biological molecule. Okay, this was supposedly the end of vitalism because you could synthesize in the lab biological, in the chemistry lab, biological molecules. Well, mm, it didn't change much in, in practical terms. Even more, in 19, uh, 1955, Severo Ochoa and Marianne Grumbermanago uh, isolated the polynucleate, uh, polynucleotide phosphorylase. And they were able, for the first time, to synthesize polynucleotides in the test tube. Uh, this is when the newspapers uh, started saying, life is created in a test tube, polynucleotide phosphorylase. <laughs> well, so life was created in a test tube. So there was no discontinuity between chemistry and biology. Oh, that's what the poor Severo Choa thought. But my greengrocer thinks differently. Uh, and my wine merchant thinks differently. And the butcher who offers chicken that have been uh, grown naturally. Naturally? And the greengrocers who, 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 who offer, not to me because she has been trained already, but to other people, organically grown lettuce. Beg your pardon? Organically grown lettuce? The, 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 the wine maker, the, 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 the wine merchant, this wine has no chemistry in it. Oh, bloody hell. <laughs> The great geneticist Theodosius Dobshansky, one of the people who about almost 100 years ago combined the Mendel and Darwin ideas to give rise to neo-Darwinism or, or modern biology, I would call it. Perhaps because of his Russian, Russian origins, uh, he was fond of serious alcoholic drinks. And uh, when he was, when this discussion of natural and uh, mineral water and, well, he would say, all waters are mineral. Um, all suns are natural. And all beers are insipid. <laughs> Vitalism never dies. Um, even if I have convinced uh, my butcher, my greengrocer, etc., people will happily pay a fantastic price for a half rotten lettuce because they are told that this is an ecological lettuce. And so on and so on. Mm. Ah, well, not yet, not yet. So, this brings me to this very important, I, thought, I told you that this chapter two was very important. And this is extremely important, the need for food education. We need to educate the people. And the essential point, I insist, is that there is no a barrier between chemistry and biology. The scientific education of our society is appalling. Our society not being the Spanish, not even the European society what would be called the first world society. The scientific education of our society is appalling. 
a few years ago after an extensive survey carried out in a whole series of European countries, it was found that over 60% of the citizens thought that natural tomatoes contained no genes. <laughs> that genes were something that were put uh, in the genetically modified tomatoes and that's something that made them obviously dangerous. Uh, so there is a need for food education, but there is a need for scientific education. Uh, when we were children and we started to, to study chemistry some 50 years ago in my case, my goodness, uh, the first day of chemistry was memorizing lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, whatever it goes. Oh. So this is chemistry. Then the second day, day two, was beryllium, magnesium, <laughs> calcium, strontium. But 50 years ago, there was no TV. And there were no electronic games. And, uh, well, and there was no nonsense in general. So we studied that because there was no alternative. But today, there are so many alternatives that unless they are complete idiots, our children say, oh, I don't want any of this chemistry. If the courses on general chemistry, when they are 13 or 14, if they started <clears throat> dealing with subjects like food, for once, food, or environment, or, I don't know, so many uh, health, so many interesting subjects for everybody, absolutely everybody. And if they were told that science is not a collection of facts, but a method for finding things, then we would have scientific vocations, many more than we, than we have. I am surprised whenever I go to the lecture room in the first year of biochemistry, I see that there are still people going there. They, 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 they must be, well, very strange people. I mean, <laughs> why are they here instead of being, doing something interesting? There is an essential need and ah. And who is responsible for this? Well, you and I are. You and I are. I am giving this lecture very often at a different level uh, in, uh, to very different audiences, insisting in, 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 in this requirement of good food education. If you start your chemistry, your very introductory chemistry course, uh, organizing uh, a meal for the children. And then you prepare mm, ham and cheese sandwiches and lemon juice. And you give them a banana and you give them some cocoa drink. We're in Spain, so it's called a cow. Um, then you can teach along the, along the meal a lot of physics of, and chemistry. You can explain why the orange juice is acidic and what acidity means, why the banana is not acidic, why the sandwich will cool down very rapidly, whereas the cocoa drink will remain uh, warm, um, so many things that will attract immediately the attention of the children. Not only that, they will explain this to their parents uh, at dinner, much to the dismay of the poor parents, but anyway. Um, but no, instead, the problem is not 
that when I started studying chemistry, we started with lithium, sodium, potassium. The problem is that today, when they start teaching chemistry, in 99% of the schools, they start with lithium, sodium, potassium. And I insist, the children are not idiots. Some of them are even clever. <laughs> so they don't want to do anything with that. Mm. An example of science that is not against, but rather goes hand in hand with cuisine is the so-called umami flavor. This is a discovery of the last uh, two decades or so, uh, a, a, a scientific discovery. It has been here all the time because mm, it was thought, we thought, that there were four basic uh, flavors, uh, salty, acidic, uh, sour, I mean, sour, bitter, uh, and, and sweet. Uh, and there were four kinds of receptors in our tongue, each for each uh, flavor. But now we know that there is a fifth type of receptor. And this is a receptor for what the Japanese who discovered this called the umami flavor. And umami in Japanese apparently means delicious. Hmm? And, um, but but uh, this receptor has a peculiarity that it acts actually as two receptors, two receptors uh, coupled so that the um, nerve signal happens when both receptors have been excited, excited at the same time. I don't know the molecular details. Probably the molecular details are not known yet. It may be a single protein with two binding sites. This I don't know. But uh, what I know is that two different uh, substances are required to excite this receptor. One is uh, glutamate or glutamine. Both work very well, glutamate or glutamine. And the other is inosine monophosphate or other uh, mononucleotides. But the best one is inosine monophosphate. Uh, Incidentally, the affinity of the receptor for inosine monophosphate is much higher than the affinity for glutamine. In consequence, you need much less inosine monophosphate than glutamate. The interesting thing is that um, glutamate or glutamine exists in high concentrations in many vegetables, whereas inosine monophosphate uh, is found in meat products. So why is it that we enjoy a good garbanzos con chorizo? <laughs> huh? Because the chickpeas provide the glutamine, and the small piece of chorizo brings the required uh, IMP inosine monophosphate. And there are so many examples of traditional cuisine in all countries, not only in Japan, in all countries, that when you think of it, there is a source of large amounts of glutamine and the source of small amounts of IMP. And this is how uh, uh, umami uh, works. And of course, this can be used to think of different new and delicious dishes. Uh, you wouldn't recognize it, but this is uh, the, 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 the soup of chickpeas and ham in a slightly modified appearance. Uh, these are um, chickpea 
uh, 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 germs. And this is a foam made out of a ham extract. And when you eat this, you, first you don't recognize, but then you realize that it is exactly the traditional flavor of our cocido de garbanzos with, with some pork. Uh, also, uh, the, the, oh, behave, yes. Also, the uh, boletus and other uh, mushrooms are a very rich uh, source of glutamine. And if you have the drop of meat juice, you need only a drop, the flavor of the mushrooms improves enormously. And this, you know why. Now you know why. <laughs> OK, the third part of it, of the, of the talk, is will you behave, <laughs> silly machine? OK. I have to take uh, more serious measures, apparently. Yeah? Yeah, OK. The, 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 the third part of my talk, and the third thing that I would like you, or the, no, the second main thing that I would like you to, to remember, is that biochemistry or molecular biology is uh, understood in a wide sense. Biochemistry can be the foundation of modern food technology. Uh, food technology understood as the technology to feed well a large number of people. Ideally, to feed well everybody. That would be the aim of food technology. Um, we have gone from empirism to rational cooking. Mm. Food technology is not really interested in gourmet eating. So nothing to do with the Nerua restaurant. No, I insist. Gourmet technology is interested in helping all of us here at CNIO or anywhere else uh, to, to eat reasonably well. Uh, collective uh, catering has been traditionally in the hands of um, military chefs, prison chefs, uh, friars who in their convent uh, were not uh, um, good enough to learn how to say the mass, and then they were put to, 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 to make the food for the others. Uh, so very, very bad precedents. But now things are changing, and we want to have rational cooking. I insist this is good food for all. This is, this is the aim, and biochemistry, and all the associated molecular biology sciences should be at the origin of this, of this movement. Probably, probably, molecular biology has made an enormous contribution to food technology. And this is the development of genetically modified organisms. Needless to say, most of our fellow citizens are absolutely mad about GMOs. Uh, they would starve themselves to death before eating uh, a, a genetically modified uh, vegetable that they are eating in, <laughs> equally. But that's, a, that's, that's another matter. Mm, it is true, it is true that GMOs have not caused yet 
a revolution in, 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 in human uh, uh, feeding. I mean, extensive regions of the planet have been freed from famine uh, with the traditional methods, traditional genetic methods for improving the varieties of, of plants, uh, animals, etc. But no doubt, the future is GMOs. And to a large extent, we are still, uh, we are already uh, uh, using them. There is no way, I mean, we, we, we shouldn't spend energy defending the GMOs. They are here to stay. I told you that we should spend energy teaching the people that there is no barrier between biology and chemistry. But I wouldn't spend five minutes defending GMOs because the battle of the so-called ecologists is lost from the beginning. Why? Because the important thing in, 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 in agriculture is not the gentleman in, in, in suit and tie that arrives there to, to, to preach the, the country people that they should not use GMOs because they are so uh, uh, um, damaging for, no, 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 no. The important thing for agriculture is the guy who is there under the boina. <laughs> That's the important thing. And from the moment he sees that he gets more money, uh, uh, better harvests, with less effort using GMOs, he will not listen to any of the preaching of uh, the inverted commas ecologists, I can tell you. Uh, so GMOs are here to stay. For many years, the surface area cultivated with GMOs has been doubling every year, doubling every year. And this will go on because, as I say, the guy under the boina is rules in, in, in his uh, uh, farm. Well, this is just uh, to uh, open your, your appetite. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, um, and these are, well, baby, 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 uh, uh, um, um, green peppers. This is a sort of infanticide uh, of, 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 <laughs> of green peppers with, with this uh, risotto. Uh, and, and this is just an example, just an example of my main message that there is no barrier between chemistry and biology and no barrier between chemistry and cooking. Cooking is nothing but a pre-digestion. You may have not thought of it, but you will realize immediately. First, only humans cook. We are the only species that cooks. Among other things, everything started with bipedalism. When the hands were free for the first time, huh? when, when the hands were not necessary to, to walk around, the hands became free. Then, and only then, the size of the brain started to increase. And the hands were used, obviously, as tools themselves and to work with other tools. And the hands were essential to cook. And cooking is, grows in parallel with cultural evolution. Cooking is not in our genes. Uh, the free hands are in our genes but cooking is not in our genes. 
all the different societies, human societies, cook. So the capacity to cook is in our genes. But they all cook different things. So the recipes are not in our genes. The capacity to cook is in our genes. And the capacity to cook was essential in the cultural evolution of the uh, human species. And a fantastic example is to understand that cooking is a pre-digestion. What happens when we uh, digest polysaccharides? Well, polysaccharides are digested first in the mouth with the mm, mm, amylases in the, in the saliva. Um, they are hydrated with the saliva. And uh, then in the stomach, etc., the, 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 and mainly in the intestine, the, the, the amylases continue working, pancreatic amylases. Uh, what do we do when we cook polysaccharides? When we cook pasta or when we cook uh, beans or chickpeas or, or whatever? Well, we do the same. By boiling them, by boiling them, we are first rehydrating them, and second, breaking down the long polysaccharide uh, molecules into shorter units. It's essentially the same that we do in our mouth when we insalivate our bread. Think of the lipids. Uh, what does the lipid digestion, uh, digestion consist of? Well, the lipids go virtually unchanged until the intestine, and they find there a beautiful collection of detergents uh, that are the bile salts coming from the bile duct. And these detergents, the bile salts, um, convert the big chunks of, of fat into microscopical micelles so that they can, the, the lipases, the degrading enzymes, can have access to the lipid molecules because they have been emulsified, that's a technical word, by the bile salts. What do we do with the lipids in, in the kitchen? Very often we do emulsions ourselves. For instance, the pil pil sauce that I mentioned, virtually every sauce is an emulsion of, of, of fat. And uh, mm, there is a very famous emulsion that we all enjoyed very much at some stage in our lives, and this was our mom's milk. Milk is a fantastic emulsion of fats. So what we do in the kitchen, we are emulsifying lipids exactly as we do in the digestion and as it was done by nature somehow for us uh, when we were infants. Proteins, they go to the stomach, pH 1, so acidic denaturation. <coughs> proteins are denatured by acid in the stomach so that the proteases in the intestine can have an easier access to the to the denatured protein. Uh, we usually denature proteins by heat, but we denature them anyway. Sometimes we denature proteins by acid, just like in the intestine. Think of boquerones in vinagre, uh, the, 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 the anchovies that are uh, uh, put in, in, in vinegar. You can see that the proteins are white because they have denatured. So again, we are doing in the kitchen the same that we do uh, in the digestion. This is, a, a, in my opinion, a very good example um, uh, uh, to show that mm, 
there is no real barrier between physics, chemistry, biology, cooking. Okay. Oh, this is this is a beauty. This is a beauty. Uh, these are well, they, what the Belgians called Chico uh, was a name in. Well, it will come, and 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 some and some red letter. It's it's. Well, uh, uh, things to eat can be beautiful, among among other things. Uh -huh. And I'm about to finish. Biophysics allows the rationalization of culinary methods. I will tell you an anecdote concerning Jose Maria Busca y Susi. Most of you have heard of Carlos Arguignano, the chef that appears on TV uh, telling dirty jokes and, and, uh, <laughs> and, and cooking uh, beautiful uh, 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 dishes. Okay, the Arguignano of the 60s was Busca y Susi, except that in the 60s there was no TV. Uh, so uh, he used to speak uh, at the radio in, in the San Sebastian area. Busca y Susi um, was one of the rare Basques born in 1916 in uh, uh, Sumaraga, in uh, uh, deep Euskadi, who instead of becoming a, a priest or, or an engineer, that were the, the two possibilities, <laughs> then uh, he did something else. He came to Madrid and he got uh, his a degree in natural sciences. There was no biology and geology back then. It was a single degree in natural sciences. And oh, he learned a lot. He learned a lot. And he was extremely interested in, in promoting a good feeding for, for everybody along the lines that I am talking. And I visited him in I think 1978 or so. And I remember we were talking for, for, for hours, for six or hours or so, with a meal in between, yes. Uh, uh, and he told me, I wasn't aware of many of these things then, and he told me of the necessity to interpret the cooking processes in physical chemical terms. And he told me, the famous appoint, this capacity, fabled capacity of certain chefs to cook things appoint, right? el punto. He said, this will disappear. This will disappear as, so, uh, as soon as we can characterize the different uh, food products physical chemically. Now I go to visit whatever three-star restaurant that you visit now, you will find that probably they have more thermometers and ovens than you have in your lab. <laughs> because uh, Busca y Susi was a prophet, and this is taking place already. I will finish with uh, famous Mr. Smith. You have heard of him. He was, for many years, head of the Glaxo Laboratories in Britain. Glaxo may also be a more or less well-known name for you. Um, but he was very fond of cooking, and he applied uh, his uh, physical chemical expertise to explaining and unifying the enormous variety of English desserts. And he used for this the triangular phase diagrams or Gibbs phase diagrams. Well, yes, there is some lipid here. I can't avoid it again. Uh, um, this is uh, one of these triangular phase diagrams. And you see that uh, um, cholesterol is in this vertex. This vertex indicates 100% cholesterol. This vertex indicates 100% sphingomyelin, and this one 100% dioleoyl uh, phosphatidylcholine. These are three 
very important components of, of mammalian plasma membranes. And we can see uh, one of the things that I, we learned from this triangle is that here there is no color. No, there is no color because these mixtures are impossible. You can have lipid bilayers in your membranes with different proportions. Oh, incidentally, if you have a point here, you, this, you can find here, you can find the composition by drawing perpendicular lines to the three sides of the triangle, and from that you get the, the composition. Okay, uh, what I mean is that you can have many compositions, but some of them are impossible. Nature has been unable to make bilayers of that uh, composition. Well, Smith used the same principle of the, of the uh, uh, Gibbs phase, phase diagram or triangular phase diagram to explain or to unify an explanation of the enormous variety of English uh, desserts. He considered that just by, consi by taking into account the fat, egg, and flour contents, so forgetting the liquids uh, and the sugar, uh, with only these three components, he could explain the, the whole variety, and he did. And it is uh, very interesting that, uh, well, you start with flour and a little bit of grease, and this is uh, homemade bread. If you put uh, grease and egg more or less 50-50, you get a, a mayonnaise sauce, which is not a sweet, but anyway. Uh, uh, it finds a place here. You are here with doing with, with, with flour and grease. You make all sorts of biscuits, but when you add some egg, you may end up with uh, crepes or, or pancakes here, etc. All of it, all of it has been rationalized in, in there. It's a very good example of, of uh, of, uh, as a word I'm thinking of, of transgression of the frontiers between chemistry and cooking. Oh, well, there are new sciences are born every other day, as you may have noticed. One of them is gastrophysics that was invented in 2012 in Copenhagen by a, a number of, of, of disreputable uh, people. <laughs> and uh, what's the future for gastrophysics? And this is my last message, a bold proposal. Gastrophysics should interpret cooking in physical chemical terms, should conduct novel research of novel mm, mm, dishes, etc., within this framework with the aim of providing better food for all. Better food for all is the real motto. And I don't have to thank uh, the European Union or Mineco or one of those things uh, for this research, <laughs> among other things because there is no research at all. Uh, but I thank Jose Nalija, who is the chef of the Nerua restaurant uh, here in, in Bilbao and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Ferris. We will all be thinking of all, all the vegetarians that we have in our bodies now in five minutes when we go to the cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone with questions for Felix about gastrophysics? Or, or, so. I'm going to make a question that goes against all these fancy pictures you put about this fancy food. <laughs> So when you go to a cafeteria now, then you, yeah. So there's, there's a film in the 70s called Soylent Green. I don't know if you've heard about it. It's sort of a future film where, where, where food is an issue and the human society is overcrowded and food is an issue. And this food is sort of an elementary compound put together just to feed people without mm. any kind of taste or enjoy mm. of the food. 
Now, there's a guy right now who created a company called like that, Soylent Green, and he's selling this. And basically what he's doing is to make sort of a green soup, yeah. putting together the most basic, you know, carbohydrates, mm. dates, proteins, to feed people. And there's a journalist who was, I think, a month under these strict diets, and he even gained, gained weight. So do you think mm. the future can be, instead of what you fantastically exposed, going to the, you know, the astronaut field, to feed us and to put inside the minimum requirements? Yeah, the future can be very grim. Uh, <laughs> but uh, my, my idea is to, to work uh, so that uh, it doesn't occur. Uh, it's better eating that than not eating. And it is also true that sometimes when I am fighting three deadlines at the same time, and it's uh, one o'clock and I am hungry, etc. I would happily have a, a glass of this green soup uh, uh, and, 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 and go on working. But, I mean, everything can be, can be used in, in a certain, in a certain uh, environment and, and occasion. But uh, since uh, food is uh, such a, 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 a source of enjoyment, uh, and it can be used to to make us live a, a longer and healthier life. Um, I am certainly committed to to avoid uh, the green soup as the only uh, uh, food for for mankind. Anyway, Malthus was wrong, and probably. The, 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 the people who predict that we will all be eating a green soup in 100 years, they, they are probably wrong as well. I prefer to think they are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what? Sorry. Yes. Yes. This is me, no? Yes. And so um, along those lines, there was, uh, I don't know where you know this, uh, there was a year ago an uh, article or a letter in Nature about how to feed the planet in 20 or 30 years. And Sort of, sort of contrasted with the GMO, GMOs, which I don't, don't disagree with, but they really made the point um, we should change our food habits from eating, because they said if you look at the use of the, ter the, the terrain we have, 80% of the, the, the terrain we cultivate goes to animals from which we eat meat and milk. Mm. Very inefficient way to do so. One of the major challenges would actually be, according to them, uh, to change our food diet again, just go back to more vegetables, uh, eating things directly from the, the terrain. We're going to gain a lot. We don't need to sort of reinvent the wheel. Yeah. We can, we can yeah. feed many, many more people. Yeah. Well, um, I think uh, they are essentially the laws of the market uh, operating there. When, when, when we need to, to I, when we need to, to, to feed more people, and the the, the amount of uh, agricultural land is already finished. Traditionally, in history, uh, mankind has been increasing the amount of cultivable land. But all of it, virtually, or, or more than 90% of it, is already used. So increasing the, 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 the amount of agricultural land is no longer an option. So maybe, mm, uh, well, meat will be more and more expensive so that we will change our habits. Because I remember when meat was very expensive and uh, only when it became cheaper because of the introduction of cheap poultry, essentially, and cheap, and cheap uh, pork, we started eating more meat because it was cheaper. When it becomes more expensive, we will, less le le we will eat less meat, and maybe we will be healthier at the same time. So yeah, that's reasonable. So with the market, we, do it. we don't eat meat ourselves. The market will organize. Mm, and I'm afraid. Uh, some people will go on eating a lot of meat. <laughs> but, but some people are always uh, on top of the laws of the market. So Felix, you are a man of many talents. You're also a singer. So do you, do you 
but I'm not going to sing now because there is no piano. <laughs> if you bring a piano and a pianist. <laughs> so the question is, do you also try to rationalize what you sing? Is there kind of physics? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. This is spiritual. No, no, not at all. No, uh, uh, singing is a bit strange because um, I don't know if anybody knows how the sound is produced. I mean, yeah, the, the basics, of course, yes. But when you apply this to, to real singing, the explanations that you hear I mean, if you know no human anatomy at all and no physics, it's all right. But if you know a little bit of it, then you are in trouble. Because they tell you that for the high notes, you have to use this space. And for the low notes, you have to use this space. Beg your pardon again? But this is <laughs> against the most basics laws, the most basic laws of physics. So um, it's better not to, not to try to, to rationalize. And then, of course, singing is about transmitting emotions. It has nothing to do with singing well or no. It's, it's about transmitting emotions. Fortunately, it has nothing to do with physics. What I like of, of singing is that when I go to my singing teacher. I leave the lab mm, somewhat earlier than, than, than usual. And, and I am with my head big like this with all these ceramides and, <laughs> and so on. And, and all my neurosis of the 60-year-old of the uh, laboratory leader, uh, grants and the postdocs and uh, so on. And, uh, and I get there, and oh, all these neuroses go. Do you think I get neurosis free when I sing? Certainly not. But I have a totally new set of neuroses. <laughs> and this is very healthy, to, to, to keep different sets of neuroses, because you can use them in different, in different cases. That's, it's very nice. Thank you all.